From Square Two, this is What's Wrong With Revenue. I'm Mike Lieberman, CEO at Square Two, and along with my longtime friend and business partner, Eric Kalis, this show answers the question many CEOs, CMOs, CROs, and business owners are asking, what's wrong with revenue? New shows drop every Thursday morning. You can find the video version of the show on YouTube at the Square Two Marketing Channel, on our website at the What's Wrong With Revenue page located in the footer, or on our free streaming service, Square2 Plus, both located at square2marketing.com. You can subscribe to the show or subscribe to Square2 Plus and we'll email you new show content as soon as it's published. You can also submit questions to the show on the What's Wrong With Revenue page of our website. Eric and I answer questions every single episode. You can also find the podcast version of the show on all your favorite podcast platforms. Enjoy the show. Hey everybody, welcome to season two, episode 15 of What's Wrong with Revenue. I'm Mike Lieberman, CEO at Square Two. I'm joined by Eric, a longtime friend and business partner. Eric and I actually just stepped back from an amazing urban adventure with some of our oldest friends up in the Poconos. So we're just now getting back into the swing of things, but what's how good could it possibly be to get into it that with a recording a uh, exciting and uh, entertaining and educational episode of What's Wrong With Revenue. What do you think, Eric? Well, while I was drinking beer and sitting on the porch looking at the lovely stream going by, I was thinking about scorecards, Mike. Of course you are. Of course you are. So episode 15, we're going to talk about setting up and using a scorecard to drive revenue. Before we get into that, let me remind everybody, if you're interested in What's Wrong With Revenue, you can go over to YouTube. Square to Marketing has a YouTube channel where you can get all of the episodes of What's Wrong With Revenue. Season one and season two are all available on YouTube at the Square to Marketing channel. Like it, subscribe to it, and leave us comments. We really appreciate all the feedback. You can also get the show on Square Two's streaming service, Square Two Plus, located at square2marketing.com backslash square two P L U S. We have channels for CEOs, CRO, CMOs. We have a technical channel on HubSpot stuff. And all of the uh, What's Wrong With Revenue Season 1 and 2 are available there. Uh, you can subscribe to Square2 Plus, And every time we post something new, you will get notified via email. And if you're into audio content, all of the Square2 What's Wrong With Revenue shows are available on your favorite podcast and audio platforms. Subscribe to them and download them and enjoy the show when you feel like listening to us talk about what's wrong with revenue. So what do we really talk about a revenue generation system? We didn't talk about metrics and scorecards. You may not know this, but Square Two is obsessed with metrics and, and making sure that we're connecting quantitative numbers to marketing and sales performance. So it makes sense that we'd be talking about a scorecard when it comes to what's wrong with revenue. You know, marketing sales to customer service, they should be working towards very specific metrics. Setting up a scorecard that provides KPIs are that are critical to your success needs to be something that's part of every revenue generation system. There's rhythms of review associated with these numbers, and they're equally important. There's certain numbers you want to look at weekly, monthly, and quarterly, and everyone on your revenue, revenue team should have access to metrics that they're working on, accountable for, responsible for, and there should be some visibility into how you're doing from a metrics perspective so that everyone can clearly see what's working and what's not working. And this is how you're going to get 100% alignment around the most important metrics and drive them up and to the right. So what I want to cover today during the show are a couple of things. One, what numbers should you be considering? Who should be accountable for those numbers? Should those be weekly, monthly, or quarterly? How do you set these goals? And what kind of tools should you be considering when you're looking at data so that everyone agrees the data is accurate? And the data is helpful. So, Eric, uh, as we were chatting before the show started, I understand you just did some scorecard work with a client. Why don't you kick us off on what we should be thinking about from a scorecard perspective around revenue? Yeah, scorecards are, um, they seem kind of obvious, but in my experience, very few companies really lean into their scorecard as a way to get insights into how they can make their marketing or revenue generation or sales close rate or whatever you want to look at more effective. So I can, of course, spout the cliche of what gets measured gets managed, but yet it's a cliche and not too many companies really embrace that. When you're looking at a scorecard on a weekly revenue team meeting format, 
you're doing two things. One, you're updating the scorecard because if you don't update it, you don't nothing to look at, right? So we say, well, what happened last week? And when we're talking about a scorecard on the uh, RGS system, we're talking about five to 10 metrics. We're not talking about a hundred metrics, right? So five to 10 key metrics that are really gonna drive revenue generation. That's the first thing we have to do is identify them. Then we load them in, then we update them every single week. So that simple exercise forces us to look at the numbers every single week. Then in the data review portion of the agenda, anything that's a little out of whack or looking a little funky can be dropped down as an issue to talk about it. So the scorecard that I was working with with one client this week, they had a dip over the last two weeks in website traffic and then subsequently new meetings booked. And we said, well, what could have caused that? They said, up. Oh, spring break, a lot of our prospects are probably out of the office. We can explain that away. When you can explain it away, it's not an issue. But what happens if their website traffic dipped the first week, again, the second week, again, the third week, and there was no reason that you could explain it away? Now it becomes an issue because our website traffic is declining. And we got to talk about how we can get it going in the right direction. That simple focus on putting together a scoreboard, updating it, scorecard, updating it every single week, talking about it, making sure there's nothing that's out of whack, puts you head and tails above your competition because now you're focused on the numbers that are going to drive your business and you're quickly reacting to something that's a bit out of whack. The client who I set up the scorecard for this morning, Mike, they had one committee looking at one number over here and two employees looking at another on, on the, over there, and they never had that kind of group think possibility where they could say, well, wait a minute, why is the days that it takes us to close the deal growing each month? What can we do in order to cut the sales, uh, sales uh, cycle? That kind of creative group power in thinking about solving a problem is exactly what the revenue team meeting is all about each week, uh, making sure we could identify obstacles, discuss them, and solve them forever. So I think that when you're looking at the scorecard concept in general, one, not enough companies lean into it. And two, the ones that do, you can actually claim it as a clear competitive advantage. Yeah, I know when we started planning these shows, you circled the sales process show as one that you were super excited about. I circled the scorecard show because I think this is so incredibly interesting to me. You know, a lot of marketing people, a lot of marketing people don't, really uh, want to be measured, right? It, it's so much easier just to do stuff. And, you know, when I started my career before Square Two, like, honestly, there wasn't a lot of measurement associated with marketing. You, if you got the ads out, if you showed up to the trade show, if, you know, the, the collateral looked good, you, you were good to go fr from a marketing perspective. And I still think there are a lot of people who think like that. So um, when you start talking about metrics and you can start, putting some numbers associated with performance makes a lot of marketing people anxious. However, it, it shines the light on the performance of the, the some teams that, that maybe typically skated under the metrics conversation. Look, obviously sales are very metrics driven. Now, maybe those aren't always the right metrics. You know, hitting your sales target is obviously how salespeople get uh, measured. And when they do it, not a lot of people ask a lot of questions, even though they should when they don't. A lot of, again, it's more like do it next month, right? There's just not a lot of conversations around really the details that are going into it. Same with customer service people, you know, how are we doing with attrition? Good. Okay, great. How are we doing with customer satisfaction? Okay, good. Great. Not, not a lot of details go into any of these three departments in a lot of companies. So this concept of a scorecard and putting measurables in place and working on them together, uh, drilling down beyond the obvious metrics into some leading indicators and some uh, numbers that could potentially show you how you're doing from a performance perspective has always been super exciting to me. And, you know, my, our experience has been when people know what they're getting measured on and they have the right amount of resources to deliver what's expected of them. In most cases, they're pretty capable of driving the numbers up and to the right, which is obviously what we're trying to accomplish here. We want to make sure that every week we're doing a little bit better than the week before. Every month we're doing better than the previous month before. In fact, lots of times, you know, clients ask me, well, you know, it, how do these numbers look? And, you know, it's a lot like your, your, the numbers you might get when you get your blood test back. Like, 
you don't really compare you to other people because everybody's individual. What they are comparing you to is, are you healthier this time we did these tests than the last time we did these tests because you took a medication or you started exercising more, or you, you changed your eating habits. So this has to do with marketing and sales and revenue performance metrics too. You know, if our sales cycle is 35 days, like, okay, that, that may be completely irrelevant to another company that has a 20 day sales cycle. So it's not like we're 15 days worse than them. What we should be doing is trying to get our 35 day sales cycle to 33 days and then to 30 days and then to 28 days. And if each month we make a little bit of progress, you're going to make a really significant impact on the business over time. So the purpose of the scorecard is really just to shine a light and to agree on these metrics and then to make sure you're working towards improving them every single week or every single month. So that's the major takeaway here. Obviously, we're going to drill into some examples and talk about some specifics and you know, who should be accountable to what. But for most companies who have been doing marketing with no numbers, your first move should just be to set up some numbers, whatever those are, whatever you're going to track, it's going to be better than what you did before. And you're going to learn over time, hey, let's add this to this. Like this would be really cool for us to track this. And before you know it, you'll have a nice, concise scorecard that will be a really good provider of how well your marketing effort is doing and what you need to be focusing on. Yeah, from the perspective of what you need to be focusing on, you know, lots of times the exercise that we take our clients through is to help them uh, narrow down what they should be focusing on, because there's all sorts of metrics that you could track. The question is, which one of them are directly related to revenue generation? Because remember, you could track how many new employees and employee happiness scores, right? That's the HR department set of metrics on their scorecard. From a revenue generation perspective, we really put it into two buckets leading indicators and lagging indicators. And the leading indicators are really very, very important because we want to be able to comfortably predict what's going to happen next month and next quarter from a revenue generation perspective. So we look at things like website traffic, right? Not that everybody in the audience today is an e-commerce company that needs people coming to their website to buy, but if you're professional services, you should have more and more people coming to your website as more and more people are aware of your services, more and more people are talking about how differentiated you are, more and more people are linking to your website as a resource for good information. And that's why we watch that leading indicator of more and more people each month coming to your website. Lagging indicators are things like, did we hit our sales target last month, right? Okay, well, we wanted to do $100,000 in sales. We ended up doing 102,000, but we don't know that until the last day of the month. Any changes that we can make to that number, uh, the opportunity is gone because it's a lagging indicator behind us. But it's important because if we hit the number, well, that gives us an indication of we're doing something right. Now we could use that insight to help us hit the numbers in the future. So a mix of leading and lagging indicators is also recommended. And a lots of times there could be metrics that are a similar to each other that you can combine or fold into one key metric that you really are going to look at. So, for example, if I'm looking at things like uh, referrals, right, and I'm also looking at um, things like uh, new sales opportunities, no, no uh, even better, uh, cost per lead acquisition. Well, they're kind of related because the more referrals I get for free, drive down my lead acquisition. Do I need to manage both of those? Am I going to be making decisions on both those metrics? I don't know. Maybe I select one or maybe I choose a third metric that actually touches both of them in a different way. So there is some conversation about you don't need every metric, but you need the ones that by watching it and managing it, it's going to give you the biggest impact on your revenue generation efforts. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And while we're talking about kind of this general revenue generation system scorecard, which I, I want to move into like what some of those numbers on an RGS scorecard might be. It's a whole host of other numbers that other people are looking at. So I don't want to in any way suggest that, you know, if we're recommending six to eight numbers on your RGS scorecard, that's all you're going to be looking at, right? There's a ton of other data. There's a ton of other platforms. There's a ton of other information that you're going to want to have people digging into in your organization. But this concept of a scorecard is just to generally give us an idea of are we moving in the right direction as it relates to revenue generation? And uh, are the metrics that we've agreed are the most important metrics going in the right direction? So I don't want anyone to think this is a comprehensive set of metrics that we're going to be looking at. It's kind of like a high level a bubble up of what might be going on so that everybody can respond to it and uh, take a look at it at the same time.
Yeah, like a good example would be email marketing opt-out rates. Important, but that's not the metric that's going to be driving revenue into the future. But it might open up a conversation when you're like, hey, we how can we squeeze more out of our email marketing campaign? Hey, let's look at some numbers specific to email marketing. Open rate, click-through rate, opt-out rate, stuff like that. Um, but that wouldn't be something I would be watching on a weekly basis at the highest level. Right. I mean, the, the email marketing manager might be looking at opt-out rates. You know, the, your marketing person might be looking at op opt-out rates once a month. But again, that's not going to be something that makes it into your weekly um, RGS scorecard meeting. So, you know, uh, before we get into some examples of scorecard metrics, I want to just make two points. One, you know, when you go through this journey of, of kind of moving from a company that has not paid a lot of attention to metrics from a marketing and a revenue perspective to one that is going to spend more time looking at metrics. You may struggle a little bit to A, come up with the numbers, B, uh, lean into the rhythms associated with reviewing it, and C, uh, know exactly how the numbers inform your action plan. Th those are things that are hard for people that haven't done this kind of thing before to start to get down, right? Just to give you some context, you know, Square Two is a new EOS client. We've been doing it only for a couple of months now. And our ability to install star card, scorecards at our company, you know, have, has taken us some time. And so there's been some iteration there. So we never really used scorecards in all parts of our business before. We definitely used them in the sales and marketing part, but not in some of the operational or HR or finance areas uh, like we do now as part of EOS. And I think if this is new for you, you may feel sim similarly, like a little uncomfortable about the numbers, a little unsure about what numbers to pick, a little uncertain about how to review the numbers and what to do if they're not quite right. So I'm hoping we can answer some of those questions today. And then the other point I wanted to make was specifically about website visitors, because I've heard a number of uh, clients basically say to me, like, I don't care about that. Just get me leads. And, you know, I've heard that so many times. I think it's worth talking about. Like, yeah, I get it, right? Like the only number that really matters to you is leads. But if you're not getting enough visitors, you're not going to get enough leads. There's a direct correlation to the amount of people that come to your website and your website's ability to turn those visitors into leads and then for sales to then pick those up and close them. So I would not be so uh, rigid that I'm eliminating any interest in anything other than one particular number when it comes to revenue generation, because those other numbers are going to give you a lot of interesting information and help you make decisions and provide some insights into how those other numbers are actually uh, developing, right? If you are struggling with leads, you need to know about your visitor's number. You can't just say, I don't care about that. Get me more leads. You know? So so many of these numbers are connected in one way or another. And we will talk about this in a little bit. A lot of people think the end game is collecting the data and reporting on it. And that's really just the beginning of the process here. Yes, you got to have the number. Yes, you got to report on it. Yes, you got to talk about it. But really what you're trying to do is use that data to uncover insights in your business. What is working and what is not working and what do we need to do about it? And that's a very difficult step to go from setting up a scorecard and tracking numbers to, be, to being able to interpret those numbers, to uncover that, that insight, that, that nugget that informs what you're about to do that will ultimately improve those numbers. So again, that also might be something that you struggle a little bit with. Well, okay, what are we supposed to do with these numbers? Like, I see they're all good. What does that mean? Are they in all bad? What does that mean? Like, it might take you some time to kind of figure out how to use the numbers, but lean into it. Don't give up. Uh, ask for help. You know, if it, you know if you have an agency like us, you know, we we constantly set up scorecards and dashboards for clients. We're constantly talking to them about what the data means, helping them interpret it. I do feel like it takes a lot of experience, like Malcolm Gottwell's ten thousand hours, to really be good at this. So. You might need to talk to somebody who has done this a lot more than you have for a lot more companies than you're doing it for to kind of start to get tuned into what to look for and what those data points might be telling you. But that will come with time. And as the better the better you get with that, the better you'll be able to respond to these numbers and the better you'll be able to move the, the, the metrics up and to the right and produce the kind of results you're expecting. So be patient and, and some of this expertise will come. 
as you lean into it and start doing it more frequently. Okay, Eric, so uh, let, let's give our audience some ideas of what some numbers should be in a RGS scorecard. Well, we have to start with looking at the buyer's journey, right? So let's assume that the listeners are mostly B2B companies that have long sales cycles and high ticket averages and a complex sale, right? Nothing that is 20 bucks that you buy on an impulse this afternoon, right? So there's going to be some buyer's journey, could be three days, could be three years or anywhere in between. When we look at that buyer's journey, there are certain classifications of prospective clients that are coming through that journey that we can quickly identify. And this is at the highest level. We've already talked ad nauseum about website traffic, but website traffic isn't enough. We have to convert those anonymous website visitors into our database so we can have permission to have a nice conversation with them, whether marketing or sales. So the next thing that I would look at would be leads or contacts that enter into my database each month. Once again, they go hand in glove with website visitors because the more website visitors, the more people will convert, the more people will get into your database. Those people we typically call MQLs, marketing qualified leads. That means that they fit the description of your persona, which we've talked about on many episodes, and they're interested in doing business with you, right? They might not be ready to buy today, but they've raised their hand and they said, I like to hear what you have to say. That's an MQL. The next vital statistic would be how many of those marketing leads are actually turning into SQLs, sales qualified leads. Those are the people that not only do they want to do business with your company, but your company kind of wants to do business with them. So both parties raise their hands. Now we've transitioned from the marketing part of the buyer's journey into the sales part of the buyer's journey. And this is where your guides or your sales team can now start to engage with these folks to guide them the rest of the way to get a signed agreement. So that's pretty important. So let's say I had a thousand visitors a month on my website and 10 of them each month went into my database. And out of those 10 that went into my database, five were actually ready to start a conversation today. I want to see it's five this week, six next week, seven the next week that I get more and more opportunities to sell my goods or services. Now, the next step is how many of those people that are SQLs or sales qualified leads are actually ready for a proposal? Because when we can actually put a proposal in front of someone, then that's a much higher level of a sales lead. We'll call that a sales opportunity. And then we want to gauge how many proposals do we have on the street this week? Oh, there's three on the street. Let's see if we can get four next week to like make that go up every single week. Then finally, the last metric that I would look at in that journey conversation would be closed deals, right? How many of those sales opportunities that we actually identified and pitched became clients? Because that gives us a percentage of how we're doing. If we get 10 sales opportunities a week and we close one, we have a 10% close rate. If we close three, we have a 30%. As a highlight here, and back to Mike's comments on insights, if you could raise your close rate from 10% to 20%, you've doubled the size of your business without spending any money on advertising. So there's some pretty powerful uh, 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 insights you could get from those numbers as well. So that's kind of the buyer's journey conversation. But then we want to look at metrics that are associated with the budget. We said we were going to do $300,000 in sales each month. How are we doing? The problem with that is it's a little bit of a lagging, right? Because deals that we worked on in January are now closing in March. Okay, great. That's where the leading indicators like sales opportunities are vital. But also we want to look back. Did we hit the number for March? Yeah, we hit the number. We wanted to do 300,000. We did 302. Great. What did we do in order to hit those three, uh, that 302,000 could be a conversation we can expand upon in April, May, and June to do more of that stuff or stop doing things that are uh, 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 feedback that we're getting that we didn't win deals. So revenue targets and stuff like that are, but they're once again, a lagging indicator. From there, you could go into a variety of indicators that are specific to your company, like industry references might be a good thing, or um, referrals are good because we know people are talking about you, but they become more company uh, specific as opposed to the larger metrics that most companies should be looking at from a buyer's journey perspective. Yeah, that's really good. And I love the buyer journey overlay because that does give you some good high level metrics for marketing and sales. I would also add a couple for, for customer service since we were talking about the revenue team. So, you know, maybe we want to uh, track, you know, attrition rate on a monthly basis. Maybe we want to track a net promoter score. Um, maybe we want to track uh, new revenue from current customers. You know, those would be all good high level 
metrics that I would throw into this uh, RGS scorecard also. Uh, with the understanding, like we talked about before, each of the metrics we've been sharing in this scorecard have a whole host of other supporting numbers that go along with it. That might not be perfect for this particular company-wide revenue team scorecard, but might be very appropriate for a marketing team scorecard or a sales team scorecard or a customer service team scorecard. For instance, if we are on the marketing team and we are looking at website traffic, what sources are providing us the most visitors? Is it organic? Is it social? Is it referring sites? Is it direct traffic? Because that's going to also uh, a signal to me where I might need to spend some of my time as the marketing manager. If if organic is struggling, I got to work to make sure the site's better SEO optimized, right? If if uh, if we're good on organic and we're good on direct and we're good on social, I might really want to lean into some referral sites. What other sites could potentially send visitors to my site? How do I get them a link? How do I do some you know, whatever partner oriented marketing with them to, to, to highlight us better. Those are all important ways I can drive those numbers up. You know, when you get into uh, Eric's lead generation numbers, you're going to look at what sources those are coming from and, you know, what pages on the website are producing those leads versus what pages are not producing leads. Like there's a whole conversation about optimization of the website from a conversion perspective that would be a second tier scorecard for the marketing team uh, around uh, lead generation. And then on the sales side, you want to look at things like uh, pipeline value. You know, how much value is there in our pipeline? Is there more value in it this month than last month? Um, what's the velocity of the pipeline? Like how quickly are our, our sales team moving opportunities through the pipeline? Uh, sales cycle days. Obviously, if you can shorten the amount of days it takes to close a deal, you can really um, up the revenue number over the course of a couple of months. Um, and on the customer service side, there's going to be a whole host of service metrics, like how many, how quickly can we answer the phone and how satisfied are people after they hang up with us? And what what, what is our take on cross-sell or, or upsell campaigns that we might, might be uh, using customer service reps to talk specifically to customers about? So uh, all of those kind of second tier metrics need to find their way into their own scorecard. It's not the high level revenue team scorecard, but a more specific uh, marketing sales or customer service level scorecard, or even an individual person scorecard. These scorecards can be very effective at uh, aligning the metrics that the company is working towards with all of the individuals on the team. And then you get this rowing in the same direction, the motion that can really move the needles. If everybody in the company is working on the same numbers and understands the metrics in exactly the same way, it's going to be relatively, I shouldn't say relatively, it's going, to, it's going to be easier and it's going to be more efficient for you to move those numbers over time. 100%. You know 100%. Well, okay. Yeah, I'm agreeing. I'm listening to your, your, your interesting conversation, but I'm also thinking, right, how that's so company specific, right? Let's say I only work by, I'm a, a therapy practice and I only get referrals from uh, referring physicians, right? So- what other sources might I add to that to diversify away from just getting referrals, right? That's like a strategic conversation that is um, quantified by the metrics. It is, and that would roll up to some rocks, right? So someone yep. has a rock to expand the sources of traffic to the website beyond just referring therapists, right? So there, it's all tied together and the scorecard makes everything very measurable. Yeah. Good. But so we does, talked about I mean, from experience, okay, it does open up some serious conversations. Like you said, strategically, 90% of our business comes in from referring physicians. Can we sponsor some conferences? Can we go one to one? Like, what else can we do to draw, open this up a little bit? Is the assumption that a conversation of review of metrics would, would uh, uh, encourage? It would. That would be a very healthy conversation if you're trying to move the needle from a revenue perspective. So we did a pretty good job, I think, high level scorecard for revenue generation. We did a pretty good job, second tier scorecard for revenue generation by, uh, by team. Um, let's talk a little bit about who should be accountable. So um, how do you talk about accountability from a scorecard perspective? Who's, let's just start at the top. Who's ultimately responsible for the company's scorecard performance in an RGS system? Well, at the highest level, it's going to be the rainmaker, right? The person that's accountable and responsible for hitting the revenue number. But 
I think when you then look at the weekly revenue team, then it's going to trickle down to different people watching different things. If I'm in the marketing uh, section of the weekly revenue team, then some of those indicators like conversion rates and you know downloads and webinar registrations are going to be my responsibility. But if I'm in the sales uh, uh, section of the weekly revenue team, then metrics like how many proposals that I have or what's my close rate or the days of the sales cycle would fall more there. If I'm customer service, I would be directly related to cross-sell and upsell and the volume of uh, revenue that comes from that. So at the highest level, though, the Rainmaker, once again, the chief revenue officer or the VP of sales and marketing, whatever you call it at your company, but that's the person who's ultimately responsible for that scorecard. Right. And then I think there could be potentially some special projects that people are working on that they could be accountable for specific numbers also. So uh, the whole concept of using metrics to keep people accountable for what they're working on and, and make everything measurable is it, it, it's not it, it's a must have in today's revenue generation effort. But I can't I can't iterate enough how common it is to have people working on revenue who are not accountable to specific metrics. So I, I just keep repeating myself because I feel like if you want to make this move, you may have to get over some, some legacy thinking around numbers in general. Uh, and it might take you a little time for people to really get comfortable with this as, as how you're going to track their performance and why these numbers are important and how to set these numbers and so forth. Yeah. I mean, look, it's a big topic that you just touched upon, right? changing, thinking differently, accepting that what we're doing now isn't going to get us to the, the 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 nirvana that we set when we created the company, right? And that's where I see a lot of reticence. Like, well, we've never done it that way, or we don't normally look at that. I had uh, one client who were made nameless. They only looked at their revenue numbers on an annual basis. So they had all year go by before they would look, are we going to hit the annual number or not, which is such a missed opportunity to make course cor correction over the course of the year to, uh, you know, uh, magnify some of the good things they're doing and minimize some of the bad things that might be occurring. Yeah, it's a really good point. But there, there for a lot of people, being accountable for a, a number that can't really be argued with is, is uh they feel exposed, right? Like everyone's going to see how I'm doing. Like it's one thing when you're in a meeting, you're like, Eric, how's it going with Project Day? You're like, it's going great, Mike. Okay, good. Moving on, right? Like not, nothing I can say. I asked you, you said it's going great. But if there's a number associated with Project Day and we're all looking at it and it's not good, like there's not nowhere for you to hide if your numbers are not performing. And I think in in some organizations, that is an uncomfortable and, and um, not uncomfortable, but no, uncommon it's a common spot, right. right? Right, uncommon spot for people to be, and and so it makes them nervous and anxious. But we, well, we really me... got to kind of graduate into a more transparent, performance-oriented culture when it comes to revenue. If you want to, if you want a system, and you want to regularly hit your goals for sure. Well, I think you just nailed it, right? Your culture has to make it okay that you raise your hand and say, "I have a problem hitting my number. I'm watching it. I'm doing everything I can, but I need the group's help." And that's where the IDS part of the weekly revenue team meeting becomes so powerful. If you're willing to share, hey, guys, I have an obstacle. Can we talk about it? You can spend up to an hour a week talking about this specific issue, which then other people in more of like a group think power structure can say, oh, at my last job, we had that problem. Here's how we broke it open. Or hey, I just thought about this idea. What if we did that? And now everybody's helping you. So yeah, if you want to be embarrassed because your specific task is not being met uh, from a metrics perspective, or you could be like, oh, I have a group that I can go to when I have challenges with my metrics. And that's where the weekly revenue team meeting becomes uber powerful. Yeah. And I, the other thing that's great about that meeting is all of those numbers have a person associated with them. So everybody is really very accountable for a very specific metric and the work associated with it. So that does tie up a lot of loose ends from a scorecard and accountability perspective. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, weekly, monthly, quarterly numbers. And you mentioned this company that only looked at their revenue annually. And so I think there's probably all different kinds of numbers we can be looking at here and all different kinds of companies that where some are relevant or frequently and some are relevant less frequently. Um, so let's just talk about that a little bit. Like most of the, so look at square two, we look at some numbers every single day. It doesn't mean we necessarily report on them, but I think in certain circumstances, depending on what's going on in your company, 
you should have kind of an idea of what's going on every single day, right? And then when the week is over and you're kind of aggregating the activity for the week and reporting on it, it should be fairly reflective of what you worked on uh, during the week. So a lot of the numbers we talked about for the high level re RGS uh, revenue team meeting scorecard are gonna be weekly numbers. Leads per week, visitors per week, sales opportunities per week, uh, new customers closed, uh, 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 percent towards uh, the, the, the monthly target because you know every week progress is being made. I think if the numbers are, are changing significantly every week, they should be reported on weekly. I think if they're not changing every week, you know, significantly, they could be reported on every single month. So for instance, like sales cycle is probably a number I would look at, sales cycle days is probably a number I would look at every month as opposed to every week, because you're just not gonna close, if again, B2B, long sales cycle, complex sale, you're not gonna be closing enough every single week to really move that sales cycle days number. But over the course of a month, there would be enough changes in the sales cycle for it to aggregate up and show you how you're doing in terms of how many days is it taking us to close deals. Like that that would be an example. So there's always gonna be some, some numbers that you wanna look at weekly, some numbers that you wanna look at monthly, and other numbers that you might wanna look at quarterly. I mean, if you're running a specific campaign um, and it's a quarterly campaign and you have till the end of the quarter to hit your number. Yeah, you want to track it as it's going along, but you may not really report on that till the end of the quarter when the campaign is finished. And, you know, you want to let everybody know, hey, we killed it. You know, we did double what we thought we were going to do. Um, and again, that's not to say you can't have interim reporting on it or be tracking other numbers that let indicate how you're doing, tracking towards your goal. But I, I, there are going to be things that you want to track quarterly, uh, monthly. Uh, and weekly. And just to add on a little twist, Mike, rolling numbers also might be effective to take out aberrations in the numbers now and then. So if you're the kind of company that has a lots of small transactions, looking at it from, let's say, a rolling 30 or 90 day would take out the whole monthly and seasonality thing, and you'd have a much more uh, longer view of what's happening. So sometimes we'll look at things on a rolling basis, and then it gives you a little bit more of a different view. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, let's talk about setting these metrics because I know we briefly talked about, about I, I briefly talked about it, but I think this is the next thing that makes people nervous is how do I know what numbers to pick? How do I know what I'm supposed to be doing? And again, I think the process here is just very simply baseline your current performance. So it's something we do with every single Square Two client. We start in the sales process by asking them some difficult questions and getting some information from them so that we can have some idea of how they're doing from a metrics perspective. And then as we get in their engagement with them, we finalize that baseline and we agree like this, these numbers represent current performance at your company. Our goal is going to be to improve those. And I think that's really all you have to do to, to simplify this entire exercise is figure out where you are today. And I would also tell you, it doesn't have to be 100% accurate. If it's 90% accurate, and you, you made a few guesses here or there to round out the metrics, I think you're going to be fine with that. Uh, done is better than perfect. I know that might sound weird from a metrics when we're talking about metrics, but I strongly believe done is better than perfect. So you can set that baseline, establish where you are today, and then start working on improving it. And while I do think it's nice to have goals for improvement, I think it's better to just be looking to make up and to the right every single week, every single month, right? You know, it, it's great that you want to go from 10 leads to 100 leads, but I'm going to be the first to tell you, I, I, I don't know when you're going to get to 100. I think it's great that 100 is your aspirational goal. We're going to work our hardest to get you to 100. I really don't know if 100 is going to take you two months, six months, or 12 months. What I do know is that you're at six now. And my goal is to get you to eight next month. And after that, 10 or 11. And maybe after that, 13 or 14. And, and as we start to see some momentum there, we should see those numbers pick up too. So when I'm four or five months into it with you, I can now say, look, 100, it's six months from now. Or 100 because we went from six to 15 and 15 to 35 and 35 to 70. I can tell you, look, I think we might get to 100 next month. You guys have really responded and the program's really responded. There's plenty of people out there who want to talk to you and the content is working, the website's working, the ads are working. Like so. Great to have a goal. It's better to just work every single month to do better than the previous month. And all of your metrics 
And as you start to dial that in, your quest to 100 will become much clearer. And so will the time frame associated with that. So, you know, Good having point. done maybe at this point thousands of programs like this for all different kinds of companies, that's generally the best and easiest way to look at it, especially when metrics are new for your company and you're trying to get everybody excited about it. People are a lot more excited when they go, wow, we hit it. Even though it was a modest goal, we went from 10 to 12 this month. That's great. If you go, if you keep saying, I'm supposed to be at 100, I'm at 12, I'm supposed to be at 100, I'm at 15, I'm supposed to be 100, I'm at 18, like people are just going to start to like check out. They're going to start to feel um, demoralized. Like when, when, when am I ever going to get there? This is taking forever. Like better to get them excited, put more energy back in the program, show them that things are working, do more of the things that are working. And you will see that trajectory. You should see that traje trajectory increase over time, as things start to compound and you start to get better at doing the things you were doing that are producing results, you're going to get there faster than you probably think. Anything you want to add to that? Nope. Okay. I'm all about Great. speed. You're all about speed. Awesome. All right. So let's talk a little bit about tools because, you know, sometimes getting access to the data is actually challenging. And I know we, you know, again, like we said, we talked to almost every single prospect about current performance and a lot of them are like, well, it's in a Google report. I don't know where that is, or my current agency sent it to me, but that was last month and I didn't look at it. And so um, I think we got to talk a little bit about where this data lives and how do we get access, access to this data. And then the other part of this piece of the show really should talk about making sure that everyone in the company agrees that the data is accurate. Because I've also heard people say, well, I know you said this, but I don't think that's right. I don't agree with that data. I don't think it's correct. And I'm just discounting it. So you don't want to be in that boat. You, you want to make sure that everyone agrees that the data is accurate. So how do we keep the data accurate? What tools should we be using to get access to this, da access to this data? How does that fit into the conversation we're having today? Yeah, I mean, if the scorecard isn't the single source of truth for your company as to performance, you are screwed because everybody's doubting the numbers. Now we can't make decisions based on the numbers and people are arguing about the numbers. So it's, you're right. It's, it's, it's gotta be uh, accurate. The phrase database hygiene comes to mind in this scenario that whatever we put in should be really clean and nice. Uh, you know, the old adage, Mike, you put in garbage, you get garbage out, right? Yes. So what goes in there must be clean. How you keep it clean is by, in a premeditated way, thinking about how am I going to put my database together so that when I extract the data I need for my scorecard, I'm really comfortable it's going to be accurate. Now, that's a bit of a trick because some people are looking at it from a non-revenue generation perspective, which might lend you to structure your database and subsequently the data that comes from it in a completely different way. Each company is going to be different. So that's why I think you have to start with some foundational uh, tactics and then make sure that the other ones are great. And I'll give you a good example of how data is not clean. New customer comes on board. Yeah, I'd like to place an order. Great. Let's get you set up with the computer. Someone is not fastidious. They're just putting in their first name. They're just putting in their email, not their phone number. They're not saying how they got to us or attribution on the marketing. We still sold the order. We got revenue, but we missed such a huge opportunity to cross sell and upsell that person. Other things, um, introduce them to other things that we might be um, wanting to talk about. Um, get referrals from them, engage with them on social. There's so many things an incomplete database does to affect the integrity of the data. I'm so glad you brought this up because this is this is a connector for me between people who want to be data driven and love the idea of metrics and accountability, but don't understand how important the data is to the the quality and the accuracy of the scorecard. Right, so. If you are very interested in starting to look at your business from a more metrics, uh, uh, a more data-driven way and using metrics more productively, you have to, have to, have to have the same kind of energy and investment in not only your data, like Eric, 100% your data, like Eric is saying, but also the platform by which you're managing that data and the platform by which you're generating these numbers. So. You know, again, if you want to live and die by the data, you then need to really lean into your data and make sure it's clean and accurate and is constantly being cleansed through some kind of systems and processes. Like there are there are a hundred different ways to clean up your data, 
make it more accurate, and then keep it clean and accurate over time, you have to be willing to invest in it. You, you can't just say like, yeah, yeah, we, we downloaded some lists and I know it's not great, but I don't care. Let's just get to the marketing, right? Like that's not going to produce good data. You, you're, 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 everything you're trying to accomplish is going to be degraded by the fact that you you underestimated and underinvested in keeping your, your database uh, of high quality. And then the last piece of it is that the tools that access that data. Again, like, you know, if you're going to um, uh, not invest in your platform, Obviously, we like the HubSpot platform, but whatever platform you're using, if you're not going to invest in that, you're also not going to have as good data and you're not going to be making as good decisions as if you're investing in your data and your data platform. So all of that needs to be part of this scorecard conversation. Um, and this is specifically for the CEOs who are getting asked this question about you know, do I want to uh, allocate some money for a data project? Do I want to invest in my toolkit? Like, yes. Again, if you like the idea of these scorecards, if you like the idea of running your business on metrics, if you want to make data-driven decisions, the, the, the data and the data platform you're using it are, are critical uh, elements of your bit, just like QuickBooks and whatever other systems you're using to manage the rest of your business, you need these to be equally accurate and invested in over time. Agreed. Awesome. You know, a lot of people are using some kind of platform, but they don't set up their scorecard or their uh, reporting uh, dashboards in a strategic way. Uh, that's where like standing in the shoes of the prospect and understanding their journey and understanding what uh, your budget was and how that all ties in. Those are the questions you have to ask you first, first, before you even start using platform one. When you have those questions answered, you can then tailor the um uh, scorecard, dashboard, whatever you're using. The other thing is you might have aggregate sources of that platform, right? Google Analytics might be bringing you one thing, your accounting uh, software is bringing you another, the, the uh, manual input from the sales team is bringing you a third. So there's a lot of other things besides, oh, we'll get HubSpot, it'll cure it all. It has to really be a coordinated strategic effort. It does. And, and again, like we tell our clients, you do not have to boil the ocean right out of the gate when you're talking about systems like this. You can start very simply in fact, I would encourage you to start simply and let the business use cases drive additional data, additional scorecard metrics, additional dashboards, you know, like just get started simply with the basic scorecard, support that, support the initiatives around the scorecard. And pretty soon you'll start to see other uh, numbers that are interesting, other data that it's required, uh, other perspectives of the data to be presented. And by simply tackling those like one at a time or, or piecemeal over time, before you know it, you have a really nice portfolio of dashboards, you have a really clean database that is constantly monitored for its cleanliness. You have a really wonderful integrated platform where all the data is, is, is uh, synchronous and, and aligned and just flows out of the system and into your dashboard. You'll be so empowered to make really smart decisions around revenue that these scorecards will become something that you're looking at, like what what can what can I impact next? Like get get the, get this in here because this is what I want to work on now. Like you'll start to see the connection between the energy and the money you're putting into it, the results that are coming out of it, and how it's impacting your business. And honestly, nothing would make us happier than for all of the clients that work with Square Two and their RGS system to have exactly that. That is the definition of a revenue generation system something that is working smoothly and efficiently to help you hit your revenue goals every single month, month of the year. Well done. And with that, why don't we wrap it up for today? Anything else you want to add? No, I, I think this is a mission critical initiative to have the numbers you need to make better decisions on driving revenue. Let's keep it at that, like mission critical. It is. And again, if you want to simply just have a conversation with us about a scorecard, your scorecard, how to use a scorecard, just reach out to us via the website. There are plenty of ways to connect with us and schedule meetings or chat with us. You know, all the team at Square2 is happy to be on call to help you with any of your scorecard and revenue generation system related questions. And with that, I'll wrap us up today. Don't forget to check out the show on the Square2 Marketing website on, I'm sorry, don't forget to check us out at the Square2 Marketing channel on YouTube. Square2 has its own YouTube channel. All the episodes from season one or two of What's Wrong With Revenue are all posted there. You can like us, you can subscribe to us, and you can leave us comments. And we really appreciate hearing from all of our watchers on YouTube. If you are interested in all types of audio and video content, including What's Wrong With Revenue, head on over to Square2 Plus. 
at square2marketing.com backslash square2plus. And you can see a Netflix style show with channels for CROs, CMOs, CEOs. There's even a HubSpot channel there for all kinds of technical content related to HubSpot. You can subscribe to Square2 Plus, And just like Netflix, we will email you every single time we post something new and you can go check it out. If you're into audio content, like many people are, What's Wrong With Revenue season one and season two is hosted on all your favorite podcast platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Apple, go check us out there, download and listen to us at your leisure. Thanks everybody for joining us today for episode uh, 15 next week. Join us for episode 16, where we're going to be doing some brainstorming around late stage sales opportunities to close them faster. So we're going to do a slightly different format show episode 16. Eric and I will do some rapid fire brainstorming to help our listeners close more late stage opportunities. And by the way, this is something we do during the revenue team meeting when the sales team brings up opportunities that they need a little help on. The entire revenue team gets activated to help them figure out how to close it. So we'll do a little modeling of that for you in episode 16. Thanks for joining us and everybody have a great day. Bye-bye.